Arnie, thank you so much for this introduction and hello everyone. Thank you so much for joining us on such sunny day. And it's my absolute pleasure to introduce Dirkian Bimon, a curator of Silver the Rijks Museum in Amsterdam, who looks after some of the most wonderful pieces of silver I think ever made. <laughs> and he has been a curator at the Rijks Museum since 2002. And together with his colleagues, he worked on the new Rex Museum galleries, which opened in 2013 after a 10 year closure of the museum. And since then, he has worked on the first systematic publication on the silversmithing centers in Holland. So, Dirk Jan, thank you so much for joining me. Thank and you, Ada, for the invitation. <laughs> Uh, our talk will take about 45 minutes and we'll make sure that there is enough time for questions. And we will focus today on pieces of Dutch silver that our museums have in common. And I'll begin with a short introduction to the collection of silver in the Wallace collection. Uh, then we will discuss ceremonial chains, examples of the civic patronage. And then Dirk Jan will talk about silver in the Rijks Museum and we'll end up with discussing luxurious baby linen baskets, examples of silver made for the elite for private use. But before I will talk about the Wallace collection, well, Dirk Jan, why silver? Why did you become interested in silver? Well, that, that took a while because I'm a specialist in decorative arts and we're not in first instance drawn to silver. I've worked on historic interiors and I've worked on furniture. And silver was to me a group of shiny things, a kind of large scale Christmas decorations. And only after a project with the Reich Museum uh, about 20 years ago, I became interested since this material has specific possibilities. There's no art form so well documented where you can now exactly know exactly when, where and why, by which ateliers works of art were made. But Ada, what was your uh, feeling with silver, your first intro? Oh, it's actually for me, it's the other way around. Uh, so my background is in silver. My first MA thesis, my first internships, my first job, they were all related to silver. And then my interest uh, expanded. And then I work on decorative arts in general. And at the Wallace, I look after a variety of materials. But I think silver is very special. Uh, I think it's that not only that works of art made of silver are so precious but the material itself and and i can really relate to what you've just said about silver being so specific and i think well you probably mean hallmarks at least that's how i <laughs> interpret it and i love reading marks uh, you can really feel like a detective when you read um, hallmarks and a few years ago i followed this short silversmithing course and i think that really helped me to appreciate silver even more and help me to realize something very basic, but I think we often forget when we look at silver, that all these like amazing three-dimensional objects often begin as a flat sheet of metal. So yeah, that, that, that's my story. <laughs> Wonderful. Mm. And what is your collection like? Um, right, so uh, just by the way, just to confirm, so you can all see my screen, I hope, all right. You can, you can see my screen, the one I'm- I can. Okay, super, great, thank you. Uh, right, so the silver collection Wallace collect uh, the silver collection in at the Wallace <laughs> is is a small collection, but we have some really important pieces, and they're mainly German. There are some also Dutch items, Scandinavian and English. The museum is as associated with French 18th century art, so one would expect to see French silver uh, here at the Wallace, but we don't really have it. And it's not that surprising because there's not that much old French silver that survives. A lot was melted down. And that's a very important feature of silver that I think people have to realize that yes, you can melt down silver. And that happened, of course, during uh, various political upheavals, uh, fiscal crisis when people needed money. And well, there were all, a lot of this kind of crisis in France in the 17th century and the 18th century, including the French Revolution. So a lot was lost, uh, but also silver is often has been melted down uh, because of changing fashion. And in the 17th or 18th century, the value of a silver object lay more in the metal than in the craftsmanship. 
so yes, a lot was melted down and not only in France, you, you know, of course, I mean, you know that a lot of Dutch silver was <laughs> melted. Um, well, the, the family, the Hertford uh, family and Sir Richard Wallace, they also owned a lot of family silver, including tableware, but that was not included in the bequest. We know that they had a lot because there are still some inventories that survive. Uh, here I'm showing you one which is specifically uh, related to their silver, but it's very basic. It does not provide much information. As you can see here, the first line it just says a pair 20 inch oval meat dishes and that's it. So I don't really know what kind of silver that was. But the, the pieces we have in the collection, they were mainly collected by Sir Richard Wallace, whom you see here. And he was interested in Kunstkammer objects. Well, Kunstkammer objects are the kind of small, exquisite three-dimensional items that are often made of precious materials. That includes Renaissance silver, and Wallace bought quite many German pieces, but also some Dutch uh, items, basically silver that was available on the market at the time in the 19th century. And here I would like to very briefly show you a few highlights. So you see, for instance, a figure of a silver ostrich with, with a horseshoe in its beak. And Sir Richard Wallace acquired it just one year after he had been given a coat of arms and the title of a baronet. And his coat of arms features an, an ostrich with a horseshoe. So I can just imagine that he must have been delighted when this piece appeared on the market. And just pure coincidence, so of course, he needed to buy, <laughs> to buy it. Uh, then I'm also showing you here a wonderful dish, which we think was made in Italy, but we don't know for sure because it's not marked. And it has a beautiful decoration. There's just so much going on there. Lots of different uh, motifs. There are uh, representations of the four seasons, uh, four elements, planets. And there's a nice anecdote uh, connected to that piece. Um, Sir Richard Wallace was not the only one who was interested in Renaissance uh, silver in the 19th century. There were many other important collectors, including Ferdinand de Rothschild. And Ferdinand Rothschild was interested in acquiring this piece, but he was too late. And at some point he visited Sir Richard Wallace at Hertford House, and he saw that dish here, and he got really, well, upset, annoyed, and then he mentioned that in his, in his memoir, that he should have uh, acted quicker. Um, another piece which I would like to show you is, a, uh, is this cup which is really small, it's like about this size. It's a perfect Kunstkammer item, not really for use, but just more to, to show. And it has this exquisite enamel decoration. Wallace bought not only European pieces, but also non-European. And we have, for instance, a wonderful pair of Chinese silver candlesticks that I'm researching at the moment. They, they have the imperial provenance. And you see one of these two candlesticks here as well. Good. <laughs> oh, and I forgot to show you this. This is the set of um, a toilet, toilet items made in Augsburg, 18th century. It's probably the largest known <laughs> toilet service made in Augsburg in the 18th century that exists. It even we, we have the original storage box. And I think it's interesting to mention that in the 19th century, there was not that much research done on silver. So Wallace not necessarily knew what he was acquiring. And I think this is a nice example. It's a small mirror. And when you check the back of the mirror, you see this inscription that claims that it was made by Bernardo Cennini, the very famous 15th century goldsmith, but I don't know, Duke Young, what you think, but I think it's very much wishful thinking. <laughs> it is. <laughs> it looks, it, what is wonderful that you have the thread work on the back, um, which is not Italian at all. It's probably, uh, could be German, could be, uh, could even be Dutch, but Giannini, no. That's no, for, for one thing, that's sure. <laughs> no, definitely not. And then I would like to also show you this painting. 
which mm -hmm. uh, shows a selection of works of art that belong to Sir Richard Wallace. We have all the pieces. We don't have the painting because the painting was not a part of the bequest. So now it's in Germany, not, not the Wallace collection. Uh, but it also shows silver. So for instance, the, the large dish, uh, which I've shown you just a few minutes ago, you see it in the background. And I would like to draw your attention to that piece in the front, which I, you can see here. And it has this very characteristic shape. It's a chain with different shields attached to it. And if you know the Wallace collection, then you will recognize it. It's displayed in the smoking room. And it's a ceremonial color that was made in Horkum in the Netherlands in the late 15th century. And I will actually show you, this is where Horkum is located. You see that red pin. And when you see Harkum, it still has this layout of an old fort. The color consists of various links and shields that are attached to it. And I will now show you a few details. So you see, for instance, one link, which has the very nice foliage decoration, and there are various figures and animals in various links. But here you see St. George killing the dragon. And St. George was the patron of the civic guard to whom this color belonged. That was that civic guard of St. George in Harkon. And Dirk Jan will tell you more in a minute uh, about civic guards. There's another link with a parrot. I'll explain a parrot in a second, why, why a parrot. But there are also other links with more uh, with animals that are more traditionally associated with hunting. And then there are these different shields. The oldest shield is the one you see on your left hand side, and it's from 1499. And originally it was decorated with enamels. But the latest shield is from 1826, but they're from different years. The one on your right hand side is, for instance, from 1692. And there are various names and coat of arms that are engraved on these shields. And then there are also the scrolls, uh, which are in fact the symbols of the Burgundian, uh, Burgundian dynasty. And you can, why the Burgundian <laughs> dynasty? Well, <laughs> uh, one of the things that you have with uh, civic guards is that um, their jurisdiction uh, is they're they're keeping the peace, but they're mm -hmm. doing so in uh, on behalf of themselves. That's why you find Saint George uh, on behalf of the city. So you will, will find symbols of the city, but also uh, for the overlord. And the overlord in the 15th century in the Netherlands, in this part in Holland, I should say, not the Netherlands, mm -hmm. uh, were, was the house of Burgundy. So you will you, you can see that they they're the privilege the house of Burgundy gave to the uh, city of Horkum, that's what this refers to. Mm. Okay, thank you. And yes, so, well. Parrots. <laughs> yes. So the, the color uh, would have been worn on very special occasions. And that would have been worn by a so-called king of the civic guard of the guild. And that was a winner of the annual shooting competition that took place, uh, well, outside the, of course, the, the town. And the target was a model of a parrot. Well, I don't know why parrot, but it was a parrot. And no one knows. <laughs> no one knows, okay. So we don't know, but it was a parrot and hence very often you have a motif of a parrot incorporated in the decoration of such um, colors. And then the winner would have been allowed to wear the color on special occasions. Uh, he was the so-called king. And then at the end of his reign, his name and the year of his reign and the coat of arms were engraved. And hence what we have is the kind of color that belonged to someone, to, to the guild with the shields that mention various kings from, as I said, 1499 to 1826. And there were three, uh, civic guards in Harkon that were active. So there's the one 
uh, that belonged, well, whose patron was St. George, uh, that's the so-called old civic guard, and that associated people who were armed with foot bows or crossbows. Then there was also uh, the guild of St. Sebastian, and they were armed with long bows, and the new guild of St. Christopher, and they were armed by fire weapons. But yeah, Dukian, please tell us a bit more about the importance of civic guards in the Netherlands. Well, civic guards in the Netherlands are, are a, a voluntary kind of militia. So they are just the burghers of the city uh, who can be, uh, who were asked uh, to, to join a fighting squadron in a, in a sense. And those fighting squadrons could be uh, used to defend the city from a problem for enemies out, mm -hmm. out from enemies out of the city, but mm -hmm. it could also uh, they're, they're, they should also protect the enemies within. So the uh, the burgomasters could ask the militia to a uh, to put a revolt down, and that is what you find. Um, the interesting thing is that you have them in any city in the Netherlands, um, and you also find many, um, and that is interesting because that means also that many of the cities once had a collar. So what you're having here is a ceremonial piece um, with a lot of chain, uh, with a lot of uh, coats of arms around it. Mm -hmm. So they end up as a ceremonial piece. And that's also the reason why many of them have been, uh, are still there. You might know the uh, civic guards mainly because of their paintings. Mm -hmm. um, here you've got the Amsterdam uh, cloveniers. Um, they were, as the uh, guild in uh, St. Christopher in Gorkum, armed with firearms. Um, and it is probably the, the, the painting the Reich Museum is best known by. But on the other side, you can see what that was put on their chimney piece. And that is the four. Um, it's the government of the of the militias, and they are presenting the silver. And the great thing about this painting is that some of those objects, which are now on the painting, are also in the Rijksmuseum. Um, one of those is the chain. You mean the picture on your right hand side showing the um, yeah the regions of the guild, and there's one man holding the. Color. Yes, he is holding. He is holding a collar, and mm -hmm. he is. Uh, what he is doing is that he is checking the, the names which were on it. So what he is doing is um, thinking about the age of the uh, of, of the cloveniers and uh, hence their importance. Because old is very good in early modern Europe. The older, the better. And you have this particular collar. This particular car is in the Reich Museum, which we'll show you now. And that is fun because what you can see is again that you have a, uh, it is later than the, the one of the Wallace. It is about 20 years later, but it has the same type of decoration. Mm -hmm. um, we have only two of those chained because you have still the full set, which is important because that is makes it um, th that helps you to understand what the thing is actually about. But the full mm -hmm. genealogy of winners, which with in Europe piece is still present, is no longer present in the Reich Museum. So that's um, very unusual to have that many shields on a collar. Yeah, because what, hap what often happens if that if they are uh, transplanted into a, a, a museum, that all the later editions are taken off. So, and that has been uh, been done in very early in its uh, in its history. I think here we know that it's was looked like this in 1804 already. So even then, when it was transplanted to the museum of the city of Amsterdam, of one of the forerunners of that, all those the coats of arms were removed. But what you also can see is some of the symbols, one of the, uh, the little one on top, that is the symbol of the cloveniers in Amsterdam, which you also see on the painting and also on other things there. It's their, uh, coat, of, it's their coat of arms. And could you explain to, uh, to our audience uh, who the Cloveniers were? Um, the Cloveniers were the, uh, one of the three uh, city militia. Mm -hmm. 
Mm -hmm. um, there you had the uh, Saint, Saint, Saint George, just as in Horkham, mm -hmm. uh, with the longbow, Saint Sebastian with the football, and in the end, in 1522, uh, a new uh, militia was reorganized and that were the Cloveniers and those, those are the ones uh, armed with firearms. And there's a parrot. <laughs> and there is of course a parrot because you have to have your parrot. Okay, brilliant. And um, but, this, yeah, but this is not the only one in the Reich Museum. Um, this is one of these. And what is great is that when you show them all together, you can get an idea of um, the differences, the local differences mostly, between one from Helder, which is the, uh, on the east of the country, which is the oldest one in the Reich Museum. It's for the, that's one from the 1480s. Um, the, the middle one, which is from The Hague, which was the, uh, the biggest center next to Amsterdam, um, the center of the court, where you have, uh, you can see that it is the guild is called uh, in Saint Hubert, so you will find symbols of St. Hubert in the, in the chain. And the other, third one is from Flishing um, in Zeeland, which is in the south of the country, close to England, the close, one of the closest parts to England. And that is a very plain one. Um, so those differences are specific to that children. And they give you an idea of what the regular reproduction in this type of thing would have been like. But of course, Within, um, it is not one of the uh, the biggest and the best, and it is not the big one of the biggest and the best is not made for one of the big centers. That is made for a, a very small village within in Brabant. It is about this size. If I I would have to grow uh, fairly uh, large to actually to be able to wear it, mm -hmm. and it is also. But it, the interesting thing is that an object like this, there is a specific design has been made. Uh, so you find all the usual elements, but uh, what happen happens here is that they are incorporated within one design. And um, all those wonderful leaves, you can also see on the Horkham uh, example, but there are also uh, little jokes going around. So you have, if you see, for instance, those mountains, which are going around, and you, and you count them. The gold ones. The little gold, the little gold mountains. If you look at them, that you you'll see that they are uh, something that they are something that they are rabbit holes, um, because and after rabbits were very important in the in the center, in the country of Sevenbergen, and it's also what their uh, their name means. So there are seven mountains, is what how the 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 name of the city translates. So you will find seven mountains, but then not bit, not real mountains, but little rabbit holes instead. <laughs> it's lovely. Uh, that is a very nice little motif, yes. And I know you also have a slide with marks. Yeah, because that's the other one which is interesting here. It is one of the few which is actually marked. Uh, that's on the back. And that's on the back. That's what you can see here is the back, where you have the, the most space. And where you can see actually each chain has been marked separately and they all have the same set of marks and what is rather strange is uh, here is that you have only the hallmark of the city and the hallmark of the master but oh, i think that you're going to tell me a little bit more about that yeah because i think before we go into details i think it will be important to yep. explain what real hallmarking is about so um often silver is marked not always as we've seen a few examples but often and what people normally would expect is the maker's mark so that's the mark um, usually with initial but not only initial that identifies the maker then you would also have a year mark and a town mark and a year mark um, says something about the year when the a piece was assayed and assaying is the process of checking uh, the quality of silver um, and whether the right amount of silver was used in alloy according to the rules of the town. But I know that you mentioned that this is here quite unusual. Well, it, it, this um, un unusual because uh, um, 
Yeah, what, what is unusual here is that you have only the two, but then you should have the, the next slide, I think. That would help now. It's because the Netherlands were... Um, oh, yes. Yeah, the Netherlands are were a federal state. So what happens is that um, defining how an object should be hallmarked and which types of fineness should be used is in most countries in Europe, uh, the uh, prerogative of the sovereign. Here, the provinces are the sovereigns. So they have their, they can make their own laws. And that hap what happens is that you is in the west of the country, in Holland, they follow the French uh, method fully, uh, even from the mid 15th century onwards in some cities. Um, in Brabant, where this piece was made, they're following uh, the tradition uh, in the Brabant tradition, mm -hmm. which is, uh, and what they do there, there, the date letter was an option, was not necessary. Uh, so some cities had a date letter by the 1520s. Um, most of them did not. And Breda is one of those examples. And that's what makes it fun. Mm. But this is also mean then that there was less of the quality check. Um, no, what, what it means is that you have different uh, types of fineness. Um, so in uh, the in Holland, you had two different types: nine, uh, 943 thousands silver in fineness, and um, I remember about nine hundred thousand in fineness. That those were the two uh, possible there. Um, in uh, Brabant, they were following the, the Flemish uh, type of uh, fineness, which is 900,000, the best, and 860, the lesser quality. Mm. So you get different types of qualities. Yes. Right, okay. Um, so if you could tell us maybe now a bit more about the, well, generally the silver collection in the Rijksmuseum and what the highlights are. Mm, then I would need probably a, a complete hour, but <laughs> to do, just, just to make it short and, and simple. <laughs> now, um, the Rijks Museum collection is the Dutch national collection, and uh, it has been formed from the early uh, 19th century onwards. And what we are trying to do is get an idea of uh, what was made in within those seven provinces. There are 56 centers, so each of them one or two pieces but mostly the, the, uh, the bulk is, of course, for the main centers of Europe, main centers of uh, Holland, and that's Amsterdam and The Hague. But what we also uh, uh, try to do is get an idea of works of art in silver and artists in silver. And that's what you can see around here. The, the, the sketchwork, which is the, uh, the reliquary bust, is one of the first objects silver object which is dated and signed in full, where the maker shows himself as an artist. And that is also in the European context, quite rare for that moment. Mm -hmm. um, then we go over to probably uh, one of our favorites as well, is Paul van Vianen, he went to Prague. Um, he was redefining what, uh, what being an artist in gold and silver is. And his brother, who stayed in Utrecht, um, Adam van Vianen, in the city, he, when his, his brother died, he made a monument for his brother, in which he redefined what the art of the goldsmith was, according to him, about. So he's reacting on what his brother is doing in Prague. And by the monument, you mean the third picture, the ewer? The third picture. This is a ewer. It looks like a ewer. It is a cup which makes it all more confusing because it used it is Europe to be used as a cup, but my, we can forget about that. But what is great about it is that it is gives ornament full reign. So where you have, a, he, he makes a wonderful kind of creation, a, which has been a, made for the, the Amsterdam Guild. Well, okay, but, lots of things to talk about, but okay. okay. And then after him, when he died in Amsterdam itself, the ideas of Adam van Vianen or Paul van Vianen were, uh, in a sense, mannerist ideas. When Johannes Dutmau came around, uh, which he did in the 1620s, 
he decided that he would adapt it and transform it into um, a Baroque kind of world, which means that it turns architectural, the, the element of architecture is uh, coming back. And you can see it here, that, so what you see here is that ornament and the figurative are separated, and it is a, a build-up, as you could say. Yes, and going back to Adam van Vianen, actually, the, the, your, exactly what you said, it's not just the ornament, it's the whole form, and this is actually my absolutely favorite work of art, and I just so envy you that you you could handle it. <laughs> well, it, it is such a wonderful object, because every time when you, you think you know it, and then you uh, end up uh, looking at it, uh, feeling it, turning it around. It, it is only, I think, a couple of weeks ago that I actually found that it is not only marked, but fully signed and dated. So in the gilding, underneath, on the foot, it says Adam van Viana, uh, uh, 1614. It is wonderful. Mm -hmm. And it never um, ceases to, well, amaze, I would say. Absolutely. It's lovely. But just to, uh, if you are thinking that the Rijks Museum is only about 17th century Dutch Republic, um, well, then you can see that works of art in uh, gold and silver are also made in the 18th century. And I would have liked to show you this example, which is a, a marriage cup. It's made in 1554. It is made by two brothers, uh, trained in, born in Orleans, trained in Paris went over to Amsterdam and became one of the major goldsmiths within the Netherlands. And what is interesting here is that we, why do we know that they were so important? Well, one of their other creations on which this golden cup has been uh, inspired, inspired, I should say, um, that's not survived. We know that object because it has been uh, published in the time itself. So in, in 1753, uh, it was, uh, and with the, this shown one print, there is a six of six, on which each of them tell what they are, uh, what it represents, what the things are, um, but also what their the different roles were. And what is great fun that is that that one was also made. That one was made for the Haag militia to turn back to where we were before. Mm, I see. And do you only collect? Dutch silver, or do you also acquire international pieces? Um, and we were a bit, a bit afraid that if you're only collecting uh, interesting Dutch pieces, um, but what will happen is that you think that the, the Netherlands are a, sep a separate kind of country, and they are of course not. So that's the reason why you, why you want to collect international silver. Um, and I think, but they should also talk to the objects which are already there. So one of the uh, things, and I think that the next slide would be a good idea then, is mm. that you have the uh, uh, one of my one of my other favorites is the uh, the centerpiece by Wenzel Jamnitze, made in the mid mid 16th century by one of the first uh, humanist goldsmiths within Europe. But you will never understand someone like Paul von Pianen, who was an embosser. Uh, and uh, if you don't know that someone like Wenzel Jamnitzer existed, he was working with a team. So uh, he uh, made sure that the best painters, the, uh, the, most, the foremost humanists, he had to write, uh, in, there's a poem on there going from underneath to on the top, which tells you exactly what it is all about in Latin so that everyone could know what it is about, uh, what you see. But it is also, you can, it is a world within itself, but it is a cast piece. So what Paul von Vianne is doing about half a century later is react and say, okay, he is a caster, I will be an embosser. He is someone who is part of a team of specialists. Um, I will do the designing and the, uh, the, the planning, the making of the, the program myself. And that is, I think, um, essential if you're talking about gold and silver. The next one is a, a piece of the great French sculptors in silver where everyone is reacting to. And I think that, um, so also in the Netherlands, and I think that your Augsburg Ensemble is reacting to that one. Mm -hmm. And the last one is probably is 
one of my recent uh, finds, and I think that, that that one is also of interest because it is it represents the it is the Fian and Ewer of the 19th century. It is the first time when uh, a goldsmith again says, okay, um, once we had artists, goldsmiths, so if I were, um, I'm going to try to recreate what Cellini, Cellini is about. And this is one of the first objects I made for that. And also the first one shown as art instead of shown as an, an object made by a craftsman. Yeah, and I think that's a very, very important point you just made now that the pieces we've been showing, they really can be considered as, as works of art. So the, the makers were real artists and not necessarily craftsmen, because generally I think, well, silversmithing is considered uh, crafts. Yeah, you're back. Great. <laughs> okay. Yeah. The computer said uh, it needed some fuel. Okay. Good. Okay, great. Uh, it's great to have you Sorry. Back. No, I was just saying that you made a very important point by saying that um, that silversmithing, that the pieces we've just shown, they're like works of art and that there are some wonderful art, silversmith who are definitely artists and not just craftsmen. No, but, I, but, I, but I, I think also that you have to read uh, to, and when you look at those objects, um, you also should, I think, uh, remember that those are uh, the exceptions. Uh, so um, there were just not enough patrons about uh, to have to, to treat things like this, also just because how expensive they were. Now, if you think that the Night Watch was, uh, we know what the Night Watch was paid for, that's about 1100 guilders, which would be uh, about three times what a good uh, craftsman could earn, which is expensive. Mm -hmm. But if you know that a, a piece by Paul von Vianen would, be, would fetch about 10 times as much, then you also know that you won't find many patrons who can actually afford a thing like that. And I think that is important that. Uh, if you're looking at self, that's the reason why I think you should look at things like this as an uh, as an exception. You should treat them as an exception, but you should also, I think, look at what was made uh, in what was also made, and thus those are things made for wealthy burghers to use to mark specific events. And I think that you have the best object for that. Well, definitely. Uh, so I would like to show you now this basket, a baby linen basket, which is definitely a very luxurious uh, object. Well, this one was made by Lucas Lauksen in Daventer at some point in the second half of the 17th century. We don't know exactly when. And here you see where Daventer is situated. So it's like east from Amsterdam. And these kind of baskets, well, baby, well, layette baskets, they were of course traditionally associated with, um, with babies, uh, and these baskets, this kind of uh, shape, were often uh, made of cane. But then the wealthiest families they could afford baskets made of silver, and that would be really a ceremonial use. Uh, so, like a basket like this would have been used uh, to display, for instance, Christian in robe, expensive textiles that were intended for a child. They are today really rare because there's only a group of seven baby linen baskets made in the Netherlands in the 17th century that are known to have survived. So there's the one in the, uh, the Wallace collection. You'll show in a minute your baby linen basket. And there are five others here uh, you see in front of you. And, but we know there were many more because they were mentioned in inventories. There's, for instance, one uh, particular family in Daventer that owned three silver 
uh, baby linen baskets. Okay. So they're associated with a baby layette, but they were not necessarily given as when a baby was born, because some, in fact, were made on the occasion of marriage. But then, of course, at that time, the marriage was strictly related. Uh, what well, the, the aim was... Uh, the aim of the marriage is. <laughs> marriage is, at that time at least, uh, to, to produce children. So there's still, there is that link. And most of these uh, baskets were made in The Hague because that's where the court of the Stadtholder was uh, located. In terms of the iconography of our basket, well, the walls of the basket uh, are decorated with flowers, with tulips and putti, uh, so these little angels, which maybe are more like child-related motif. But then the plaque, which is in the middle, well, it has nothing to do with, with babies, really. It's a scene of Apollo chasing Daphne, and she's turning into a laurel tree. And in fact, this uh, motif was uh, taken from uh, Paulus von Vianen. And you, in the Rijksmuseum, you have this round plaque uh, that is, well, I think attributed to uh, Paulus von Vianen. Well, it is Paulus van Vianen. Mm -hmm. uh, uh, we know that the silver, uh, the, the example in silver exists as well. Um, and important uh, inventions, uh, especially were uh, cast off in that and then uh, collected by gold and silversmiths so they could use it. So what we do know is that the Meneer Lucas Leipzig in Deventer probably had such a plaque, yes. Definitely. And then the marks on our basket are really interesting. So you see in the first row, there's a, the combination, you have three uh, marks. And the first one is the mark of the silversmith, Lucas Lauksen. Then the middle one, that's the uh, mark used in, in Deventer. And then the third one is probably a mark of the assayer, but we don't know exactly the details. But then the middle one, the, the one that was used in Deventer, is really interesting because it not only tells us that the piece was made in Deventer, but it also tells us something about the quality of silver that was used. And what was quite special uh, in Deventer was that three marks were used, three types of marks. And the first mark, you see that's the black and white, uh, in the black and white picture, it's that mark of an eagle. And that tells you that an item was made in Daventer and that the lower quality silver was used. So you would have about 83% of pure silver in alloy. And that mark is found on the majority of pieces made uh, in Daventer in the 7th century. Yeah. Then there was a second mark, which is that shield. That's the, the second uh, black and white picture. And that's found on fewer items. Uh, and that's higher quality silver, that's about 89%. Whereas you also have the third mark that was used and that's the combination of the two. And that tells you that the piece uh, was made of like about 93% of pure silver. So that's the highest uh, amount that was used in Daventer. And that's a very, that, that mark is really rare and you don't find it often, but it is, uh, it was used in, on our basket. Now, we don't know that much about the silversmith, about the Lucas Lauksen. We do know that he trained in Amsterdam, uh, where he must have become familiar with the form of the basket. And then he moved to Deventer. But do you know anything, uh, more objects uh, made by him? Are they of the same kind of quality? Uh, so we know other items that are by him, but they're not of that quality. They're not that spectacular. They're usually very simple beakers. Um, so now that one is, so it seems like he did the very, like various types of objects. Mm -hmm. Okay, but, but that, I think that is expected for a smaller, a smaller center within the Netherlands, because then you ha don't have the, um, the, the group is not big enough to specialize. Mm. So one atelier, there is one atelier doing, uh, getting all the, uh, all, the, all the work that is, has to be done, is done mm -hmm. by one or maybe two or three ateliers. Whereas in uh, cities like Amsterdam, while well, you have in the mid of the 17th century, you have 400 gold and silversmith work, 
working at the same time, then you get a very about seven or eight different kinds of specializations. But it is good to see, what is interesting to see is that when you have one object of a spectacular quality, mm -hmm. especially from a small center, um, you know he is a good goldsmith. Mm -hmm. But if that's the only thing, if the, if the others are the only thing which we still know of, then you tend to think, okay, he's one from Dave and Turner, but likely, well, they make beakers, kind of thing, that kind of thing. It's wonderful to see an object like this. Yeah, of this, of this quality. And we don't know to whom this basket belonged, but I'm curious to hear about your basket because you have the seventh one and you actually know the, the history of your, of your basket. So please tell us more about it. Well, the wonderful thing about our basket is, um, well, you can see that you have the, the, it is the same idea. You have mm -hmm. the same type of decoration. Ours is a little bit more in keeping with the idea of uh, children because you have a group of children playing violins and a little con giving a little concert. Um, they are um, specific for harmony, harmony within the family. So you could use it as a marriage basket as well. But the great thing about ours is also that you have in the top of it, you have a small scutcheon. And there you have a name. Um, and that is great because that name tells you, uh, uh, gives us the name of Abraham von Welvelde, um, who was living in Farmsum, which is a city in the north of Groningen. Um, <clears throat> but I think that we should go over to the next one. But, I, but we don't think that he was the receiver of the basket. Mm. What I do think is because what happened is that he was the last of his family to survive. So he, what he did, he had a, the run, run no issue, you, he couldn't hand it down. So what he did, he, was, he gave it to a church. And that was the church the family had a patronage for. And that is a very small church still standing in Ilde, where you have here a photograph of about 1900. And you can see that within that church, you have the pulpit, but also the different um, places for the families who actually were the most important of that part of the country um, with their coats of arms. So we know that from that moment onwards, from 1717, it was not, it was used as a bread basket uh, in the Lord's, uh, used in the Lord's Supper four, to four times a year. And we have even some account where it needs to be cleaned, it needs to be prepared, et cetera. But that is great because you have a full pedigree. You know where it came from, mm -hmm. but you can't. Uh, um, but you all and you know what happened to it within the in the 19th and 20th century, and also why it was preserved because it was given to that church and acted as a monument to the family who no longer existed. But what we also have done, what I've done, is there is a little bit of a problem there in why he can't be the child the thing was made for is because he was born in 1662 and the basket was made in 1660. Mm. So then I thought, okay, let's go back. Let's try and find out uh, if we know uh, uh, if there was a child born in 1660. And the great thing is that we have found, uh, we have, we've got result. And there, uh, that is my last uh, image, I think, is that his older, his daughter, his older sister, was Josina from Belvelde. Um, she died in 1680 and she was born in 1660. So what we think is that for her baptism, the family went to Amsterdam and got themselves a basket. Mm. What is great about the family and what is even more special is that uh, a portrait of her does exist, uh, which you see on the, on the left. And that was made for a, a, by an an artist working in Groningen and in Frisia. So where they are local in things like painting, mm -hmm. they are, um, they want the best and go to Amsterdam to get themselves their Dayat basket. And I think that that is one of the beautiful things uh, you have in Silva, is that where you can think, where you, that, it is, that tells you something about what Silva is about. For them, it was important. For them, that is why they asked 
the best master, the best painting, and even more important than for us now, painting well. And I, if we have reached that conclusion today, that would be wonderful. <laughs> well, I mean, it's also, I think, fantastic that you're able to, to do all that research and like find the history of the items and they're much more alive. But right, I think we are running out of time and I want to make sure that people have the opportunity to ask questions. So I think I will at this stage, uh, thank you, dear Ken, so much for, um, for, for our chat. And I really hope that people will be encouraged to come to the Wallace Collection, to come to the Rijks Museum and to really look at these pieces, to examine them. Um, yes, and we are very happy to, to take any questions. <laughs>